Back in my first video on the nine most disturbing books that I have ever read, I ended my list with a book that I could not finish, to use my own words. That, of course, being Tampa by Elisa Nutting. However, now that I have been preparing my thoughts for this video, I realized that my word usage was perhaps wrong. The problem with Tampa was not that I could not finish it, but rather that I chose not to. I got to a certain point in the story where uh, certain things just started to happen. So I simply closed up my little book, I set it aside, and I said, I'm good. It was my choice not to go on, despite the fact that I very much could have. There was nothing in the prose, nothing in the word usage or arrangement, even not necessarily in the content itself, that stopped me or prevented me from moving forward. As disturbing as the subject matter was, the rest of the books I talked about in that video weren't really any better. I simply could have kept going and I'm sure the particular passage that made me stop reading would eventually have moved on to something else. A lot of the reasons why I stopped reading Tampa were personal and also had to do with the way the story was being told. Suffice to say, I want to recant my previous statement and say that Tampa is not a book that I cannot read. It was simply a book that I chose not to read. One of many, in fact. Despite my YouTube channel's pretense in portraying me as an avid reader and literature enthusiast, do not let appearances fool you. There are a handful of books in this bookshelf that I simply chose not to read, and even more still are in storage somewhere. Whether the first few pages just didn't do it for me, or whether the subject matter did not interest me, or whether I just didn't care, there have been many books throughout my lifetime that I have chosen not to read. Tampa was only special enough to be at the end of my list because it made me very uncomfortable, and because it was addressing a part of me that felt hurt in some way. I think things just got too real, which is not a usual reason for me to stop reading something. But this got me thinking, and those thoughts eventually evolved into the script of this video. Is there a book which I cannot read? Have written words ever had the power to stop me in my tracks, to just cloud my mind and pull a break on my cerebrum and just say, stop, you can't do this? There is indeed one book that, by the sheer power of its words, has made me unable to read, just physically, emotionally, psychically. But before I get to that book, I wanted to make this a little more fun and expand and exhaust the possibilities of what exactly makes a book unreadable. I have narrowed things down to eight different categories of the possibilities behind books that many may be unable to read. So without further ado, I want to start exploring this question. Why can't we read certain books? First, I'm going to explore perhaps the most literal answer to this question. Sometimes we cannot read certain books because they are written in a foreign language. As simple as that. For this category and the ones that follow, by the way, I am speaking strictly in terms of readers of the English language. Some years ago, a friend of mine traveled to Iceland. And while she was there, I asked her to bring me a unique souvenir. I wanted a book that was published in Icelandic. I specifically asked for Sjálstedt uh, Folk by Haldor Laxness, which I think translates to independent people. I wanted this purely for the novelty of it. Um, obviously, this is a book that I cannot read because I don't know the first thing about reading in Icelandic. I can read Spanish. In fact, I own and enjoy many books in Spanish, which is my native tongue. With a little effort and a dictionary handy, I think I can maybe struggle through a short story in Portuguese. Honestly, as seemingly dumb and on the nose as this category might seem, I wanted to include it because knowing that there exist thousands, millions of books out there which have remained untranslated, trapped in their own tongue, which readers who do not know that tongue will never be able to enjoy for some reason, that fills me with existential vertigo of some kind, that for some reason it makes me really uneasy. More so than non-English languages, however, there are certain books that are not necessarily written in a language other than English, but the English jargon and slang deployed in the prose makes them extremely difficult to get through. Uh, Train Spotting by Irvin Welsh comes to mind, which is a mixture 
of Scots and British English and a lot of the language is written out phonetically, which is just an absolute nightmare for someone such as me for whom English is a second language. Uh, a Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess, of course, is written in a made-up cryptolet called Natsat, which is a mixture of Russian and English. Burgess himself was a linguist, and it speaks to his infuriating skill with language uh, that he was able to create an entire jargon that could give anyone a headache. However, as to the question of unreadability that I pose in this video, um, this category isn't entirely an answer. Foreign languages don't necessarily mean that a book will remain unreadable forever. We could all just learn a new language. It would be a struggle of years, but technically speaking, it could be possible. Even with made-up jargon as to the case of Burgess, there are guides that we can utilize, and indeed such guides were my best friend when I was making my way through the book. Therefore, this unreadability category is tenuous, for it can be undone with tremendous effort, which quite frankly, I don't have the mental capacity to undertake at this point in my life. Um, but that's why I kind of wanted to have this one as the first one, because it's kind of like the weaker of the bunch. Next, I'll talk about a category that I know for a fact many people struggle with and are, are often deterred by. For many people, books may be unreadable not because they're in a language other than English, but because they are written in outdated English. This is why so many high school students nationwide detest Shakespeare. Shakespeare is an unreadable nightmare to many, a bundle of diction that may as well be a foreign language. As an English major, I mean, honestly, I can't relate. Just kidding. It definitely takes a lot of getting used to, and picking up an Elizabethan text is, of course, more than anything a labor of conditioning. I'd like to say that I have fought the good fight with Shakespeare, but I can definitely see why so many people would just not even try. Especially with, let's face it, the subpar quality of a lot of public education. But I think also it's the lack of relatability when it comes to reading about situations that are centuries apart from our living existence and involving characters with an entirely different set of ethics and behaviors. At least these are the main complaints that I have heard English students voice when it comes to older works. We could even consider way older texts, texts of the old English like Beowulf, which are technically not in a foreign language, but they may as well be. I remember our English textbook in my senior year of high school had Beowulf printed in the original Old English. Our teacher asked just a random student to begin reading it as a prank because I don't think he was paying attention. And when he looked at the page and he was confronted by the Old English, like, the look of horror in his face has never left my mind. More than just hilarious, however, I think it made me think perhaps that Old English version of Beowulf read the same way to him as Shakespeare did. Hell, I've met people who scowl at my suggestion that they read anything pre-1900s. There's definitely something traumatic about high school English classes that makes millions of people associate unreadability with older texts and their outdated jargon. Personally, this pains me because I think a lot of romantic and Victorian literature specifically is quite beautiful and bizarre and unique. However, 100%, I get it. It's not for everyone. Next up, I'm throwing out a sort of catch-all category for a particular mode of narrative. Some books may be unreadable because they are hard to follow. For you to understand what I mean by narratives of this kind, I think I need to delve a little bit into some literary history. The beginning of the 20th century brought about two world wars, scientific innovation, new modes of colonialism and globalization, and along with all this, I suspect a real crisis of human integrity. As a response to all this, to things falling apart, to quote Yeats, authors began to wonder about the self. And they began to wonder about the self a lot. More than just wondering, I think a lot of authors started to get lost in themselves, obsessed with their thoughts, just frantically and compulsively collecting fragments, evidence of existence, of being alive, of being a singular being, experiencing and witnessing the world at large. That is what we call modernism, and that is also what a lot of people call a headache. 
A lot of us learn the term stream of consciousness sometime in school to denote this prose-oriented trip into consciousness and the interior workings of the mind. In written form, thoughts tend to flow freely, distended, often with voices echoing and fighting against destruction, against the undoing of the world, where a clear and concise narrative is, quite honestly, sometimes optional. Authors like Virginia Woolf and William Faulkner understood the disjointed nature of voice as it pertains to thought, and it reflects heavily in their work. For the average reader, or really perhaps any reader unfamiliar with this sort of writing, however, these voices may just read as a jumbled mess, just obsessions with phrases and words that really amount to nothing. I can definitely understand why a lot of the time people will just put narratives like Mrs. Dalloway or The Sound and the Fury away in frustration. Frustration, that word I think permeates a lot of the reading experience for works of this kind. Frustration, in my opinion, is a perfectly valid reason behind unreadability, and indeed I can see a lot of these works being deemed unreadable. I can also see the goal of a lot of authors being precisely to frustrate and confuse, Though perhaps I wouldn't say this so much about Wolf or Faulkner. No, no, no. If you really want to know who the champion of unreadability and frustration is in this regard, enter Mr. James Joyce. We're going to give Mr. Joyce his own category soon, don't you worry. But for now, it's worth it to say that Ulysses is perhaps one of the most frustrating pieces of fiction ever penned. The sheer mention of it can just send millions of English majors cowering to a corner in fear. I mean, look at this thing, this taunting beast filled with run-ons and obfuscation. It's a true accomplishment of the English language, a rightfully celebrated contribution to Irish literature, and yet to call modernism and stream of consciousness endeavors like this unreadable is not too far from the truth. Have I personally read Ulysses? Well, I've read sections of it, and let me tell you, this thing is not fucking around. To me, this is not wholly unreadable, but it's damn near close, I would say. This is indeed kind of a weird category in general. In all of these works, I think the words are intelligible. No jargon is ever too esoteric or advanced. And yet I think it's the placement of the words, the placement of sentences and snippets of thought that make them challenging and enigmatic. Personally, if you want me to summarize these things in a few words, I would say they are glorious psychic attacks. Moving on, books may be unreadable because they are rife with advanced knowledge and theory. This may need some explanation, which I will get to, but I can just feel countless of philosophy and literature majors nodding in agreement with tears running down their faces. Introductory courses will often ease you into ideas, and perhaps you'll spend the majority of instruction easing into just one particular idea, one particular theory or form of reading. As an undergraduate freshman back in the day, <laughs> text seemed so simple, and the act of reading was as simple as just sitting down and opening a book. I mean, it still is largely like that, don't get me wrong, but what I'm trying to say is that my college education opened my eyes to a different kind of literature, a literature of highly specialized texts for which reading involves the constant juggling and assessment of ideas as you move along the page. A single word may be able to allude to an entire school of thought or research area, which you then have to comprehend, and to comprehend it, you need to comprehend many things that came before it. For a lot of these texts, reading is akin to juggling while riding a unicycle while singing a song. If any of you have been exposed to Spivak or Derrida or Hegel, etc., you know exactly the kind of reading that I'm talking about. Cognitively, you can just pick up any of these books and read. You can sound the words out, move from page to page, but comprehension will most certainly be out of the window. As a PhD student, I was tasked with reading Elements of the Philosophy of Right by Hegel. This was by far the most excessive and cruel sentence to which I have ever been condemned. You know, I found myself reading maybe a page or two and then just stopping and looking out the window in despair, wondering where it all went wrong. I can definitely say my grasp of the concepts was near non-existent, and the true misery of facing a text that was unreadable was very palpable. My professor even told us a humorous story uh, before assigning the reading, though I assure you I was not laughing. 
He said he once approached one of his own professors to talk to him about his own inability of comprehending Hegel when he was a student. When he was asked how much he was reading, he answered, oh, I've only been able to go through like four or five pages a day. And then his professor replied, ah, see, there's your problem. You're reading too fast. These highly specialized texts were not written to be unintelligible, per se, although with Derrida, I have my suspicions. Therefore, they do hold an audience. They engage thousands of readers worldwide, or maybe more like hundreds. Unapproachable might indeed be a much more suited word to describe them rather than unreadable. They're inaccessible, hermetic, and obscure in their ideas, but certainly to highly trained scholars, which I am not, they are readable by all means, perhaps even enjoyable if you can imagine such a thing. Therefore, fully unreadable, they are not. You just need about six or seven years of training and student loan debt to finally get it together. Thus far, I have discussed categories of unreadability that mostly involve an untrained audience. These are cases where fine-tuning and a scrambling of the brain is all it takes for the unreadable aspects of these texts to be overcome. However, what would it mean, for instance, if the unreadability is coming from the author? This would be a case in which we would say some books are unreadable because they are purposely written to be so. Enter James Joyce. Again, I believe it is law that if you're going to make a video about unreadable books, you have to bring this man into the conversation at least twice. After penning Ulysses, Joyce reportedly refused to write a single word for two or so years. Then, slowly easing back into writing fiction, he thought of many brilliant ideas which he shared with colleagues, ideas about linguistics, humor, wordplay, puzzle making, these disjointed narratives were soon pieced together into his final novel, the one that many have simultaneously called his best and worst work, Finnegan's Wake. It always bothered me that Finnegan's lacks an apostrophe, but trust me, that is the least of our troubles. Whether it be the work of a genius, insanity at play, or simply the piecing together of a falling language through the eyes of a broken man, Finnegan's Wake is rightfully considered one of the most difficult pieces of literature ever written deliberately so. This work, close to 20 years in the making, presents a narrative in which almost every single word is suffused in double entendre, wordplay, some kind of portmanteau or made-up term a la Lewis Carroll, and multiple layers densely crammed in the narrative move along in broken, unpunctuated sentences. Each line necessitates perhaps a paragraph's worth of footnotes to explain the hidden layers of metaphor and wordplay, and as you can see, this book is over 600 pages long. Here, have a listen for yourself. Boblis Goblige, for as Anna was at the beginning, lived yet and will return after great deep sleep, revising on a white night, with the cows of Drummondheim a shower as there's wet and clouded where we clow, or a whittle rose rot truant in a thorn tree. We dreams our dreams, tall Bappy returns and sign a news. We will not as shall you be this passing of order, orders coming. But in Herber's country, in the country of our blood, and in the city lay of Legion, they look for its billing ever yet. As an example of the sheer amounts of insanity we are working with here, back in 1997, a book club in Cambridge University undertook the task of reading this thing as a group, and their journey proved slow and difficult, but I can only imagine ultimately rewarding. Although the nuances of certain details remain to this day up to debate, the book club sure managed to decipher that this indeed contains characters and even a plot. Ultimately, the dedicated scholars, despite facing quite the challenge, were able to celebrate their victory over reading such a difficult book in 2010. Yes, it took a dedicated group of Cambridge scholars 13 years to read one book. This proves two things. One, that this book is not entirely unreadable. There have been recorded cases of people who have managed. And two, it's still very much is unreadable by many senses of the word. The sheer amounts of frustration and vexation that it provokes is a testament to true unreadability. I think certainly many people's minds could just not handle it. It is a deliberate challenge to our language and cognitive skills. Why do I even own a copy of it? Well, because I think it's a privilege to hold such a legend in my hands. 
Although I'll probably never even get close to begin to read Finnegan's Wake, nonetheless, I admit that James Joyce was a true mad genius, a provocateur all the way to his end. And although a book like this is unreadable, it still, somewhat ironically and paradoxically, stands as a true testament to the mighty prowess that literature is. All right. Many of these categories I've laid out have led to somewhat unsatisfying conclusions. Finnegan's Wake is perhaps the closest I have gotten so far to describing a truly unreadable book. And yet, as I said, after 13 years, some people have managed just fine. Though I cannot speak to the level of exhaustion and the consequences that soon followed. As I said, I have presented more or less a list of challenging books. Difficult and inaccessible, yes. Unreadable, but only in the sense of mental exhaustion, maybe. Books can also be unreadable, however, and this is perhaps the most direct answer to the question posed in the video so far, because they are undecipherable. Yes, such texts do exist. In 1912, Polish book collector Wilfred Wojnik chanced upon the rare find of his lifetime, a codex which would pass through the hands of scholars and specialists over the decades, but the contents of which remain undeciphered to this day coined the Voynich Manuscript, though at first glance one would be compelled to dismiss it as meaningless scribbles, by all scholars' accounts, this is a book that has a consistent and organized scripture and which even includes illustrations to aid in its reading and comprehension. Reading and comprehension, however, are two words that are still not associated with it. Military code breakers, scientists, cryptographers, linguists have all tried to decipher this and failed. The material on which it is written is carbon dated as belonging to the mid-15th century, but as to the specific year of its writing, its author, its purpose, nobody knows. Of course, many have offered possible explanations, ranging from it being a simple hoax to it being the literal language of God descending upon mankind, or it being the text that once deciphered will bring about destruction and chaos. But the tamer, more plausible consensus, drawn from its illustrations of various plants, is that it's probably a book on herbology, but what about herbology? Your guess is as good as any. There may exist other codices that share this undeciphered, unreadable nature, but the Voynich manuscript is the only one that I'm aware of, and at least it's the most famous. And I think there you have it, as far as unreadability goes, this is probably the best that you're going to do. And now, before I get to the main and final attraction, the one book that I cannot read, I wanted to include this other category because of its pressing importance. Perhaps the saddest of all reasons included in this list, I find it right-minded to mention that sometimes books are unreadable because they are banned. Thinking on the implications and real-life examples of this mode of unreadability is quite frightful and heartbreaking. I don't mean to get too political in what is meant to be more of a lighthearted video, but when discussing unreadability, it's near impossible to avoid politics. For instance, during the five-year reign of the Taliban in Afghanistan from 1996 until around 2001, in a symbolic act of rejection against Western art and thought, all books were banned. Yes, all of them. Every single library in the nation of Afghanistan was destroyed. Although these extremist acts were quelled in later years, as recently as 2009, thousands of books continue to be destroyed in Afghanistan, an obvious act of warfare that begins a destroying expression and vicarious experience to a terrorizing effect. To be illiterate might be one thing, but to have the ability to read and yet have the material in which to enact your reading forcibly and definitively taken is a level of horror I cannot even imagine. Beyond this extreme act of suppression, books have been banned and challenged nearly everywhere in the world, not just including, but especially in the United States. Although we associate acts of book burning and heavy censorship with fascist regimes of years past, the United States government has been as complicit in these acts of banning books since the birth of the nation. Dating back to the 1800s, the government has backed many attempts to censor or suppress literature in what has been deemed a battle against obscenity. But as we have learned throughout history, obscenity is a very free-form, manipulative, and exploitable term. 
Texts ranging from classic antiquity to novels that are now part of almost every high school curriculum, the U.S. did not have obscenity laws overturned until sometime around the 1960s, and various texts remained banned until then. Even until the 1970s, texts like the Anarchist Cookbook came under FBI investigation because of the potential dangers that it implied. And although not banned, investigations on its contents and its readers persisted within the FBI for years, which is a really scary thought. It is this idea that what we read can deem us public enemies, dangers to society in a very real way. I think this adds a new meaning to the term unreadability, the fact that the problem is not whether we can read something, but whether we should, and more importantly, who's deciding what we should read. Moving beyond government-backed censorship, I'm sure we're all familiar with the constant challenges that certain books have faced by parenting and teaching associations. Oh, what a cruel and disgusting irony to me that the institutions that have persistently demanded censorship and the banning of literature to this day are institutions of learning. While not banned in a definitive sense, challenging certain books certainly limits the readability of some texts, especially for the younger audiences the most impressionable minds that should be receiving the most exposure to this reading. To recount a personal anecdote, I once had a book yanked from my hands by a teacher in middle school who did not think it appropriate that I should be reading Stephen King in a classroom. We don't often think about the seriousness that actions like these have, but for 13-year-old me, this certainly meant that a lot of books had the threat of becoming unreadable because of those that had the power to take them away from me. This is why many, me included, have voiced the call to action that we should all read banned books at all costs. Okay, all right. So finally, the decisive moment. Once having exhausted every single possibility mentioned previously as to what makes a book unreadable, what do I make of this last book that I have yet to talk about? Running through the list I have put together, I fail to see how it can possibly fit into any of those categories. This book is written in English, a modern English that's easy to understand by anyone with an okay grasp of the language. The narrative is not hard to follow at all, and nothing in its jargon suggests any need of specialized knowledge to decipher its meaning. As far as the voice and sequential nature in which it is told, Nothing in it suggests that the author meant to confuse or stump his readers. It is not some obscure, undeciphered codex, and although it faced a troubled publishing history for decades, this book is not banned and is readily available for purchase at any bookstore that supplies it. So then, what makes this book unreadable? I am holding in my hands the one book that I can say for myself is unreadable simply because I cannot read it. Some of you may know it, indeed many of you may have actually read it, and some may have read it without any trouble, though I sincerely hope that's not the case. This is Hog by Samuel R. Delaney. I purchased this copy back in 2013, and the only reason I know this is because when I reached around page 30, I took this Staples 15% off pass, which expires in September of 2013, I used it as a bookmark and then I set the book aside and I said to myself, I cannot do this. I first heard of it during my teenage years as a curious and probably very disturbed young boy who yearned to read all things macabre and shocking. I was not able to actually purchase a copy for myself until my college years and that is where my experience with reading this book pretty much started and ended. Some people commented on my first video asking if I had read Hog and wondering why I did not include it as one of the most disturbing books. I voiced my opinions in the comments and I am voicing them again now, right here. I cannot read this book. The few pages that I read involved child prostitution and constant sex acts escalating into incest and then I put it away. Now you might be thinking to yourself, big deal, right? You might be saying, Juan, you talked about the girl next door. You talked about Birdman. You talked about cows. Hell, even at the beginning of this video, I said something as disturbing as Tampa was readable, and I could very well go back and finish it. I'm simply not going to. But the unreadability of Hog goes beyond its hyper-violent taboo subject matter. Although, of course, that's related. 
First, I have to say, I have actually read some of Delaney's other works. His short stories and his novel Babel 17 are actually some of my favorite works of science fiction, a genre that he is primarily associated with. Delaney makes astute observations on sexuality and gender throughout his works. He makes a point of including openly gay characters in many of his stories and is overall imaginative and highly skilled writer. Delaney is not someone who writes smut for the sake of being offensive or edgy. Delaney is an intelligent man and by all accounts and by the praises that this book has received, Hog is an intelligent work of fiction. It has a story to tell. It has a brain pulsating under its veneer of shock. It has believable characters with complexity that is skillfully drawn. Or so I have heard. <laughs> And being familiar with Delaney's work, I have no reason to disbelieve it. As far as other shocking works of disturbing literature that I have read all the way to the end, which may have included similar or maybe even worse subject matter, I find that the common factor that makes them readable, and this unreadable, is that although those works are suffused in violence and taboo sex acts, they're told through a narrative that makes them enjoyable or at least bearable. Reading is all about voice, in some ways, the voice that guides you through what you are experiencing. I can say the voice in Ketchum's Girl Next Door is innocent, human, sometimes hopeful. The voice in Cows is peculiar but bizarrely endearing and very comical. The voice in Tampa is perverse, unlikable, monstrous, but it is a human voice telling you a story. I just don't care about the particular story that it's trying to tell. Yet it's a bearable voice, it's a readable voice. The common factor here is that these are all human voices, dealing with human expression, and the same can be said, I think, of all books, even the most fantastic and outlandish. Even if they're not first-person narratives, the third-person voice telling the story we can still identify as human, and it's speaking to us in a human language. Hog gives us no human voice. And I know that may be hard to imagine, but here it is, 300 pages of it. Our main character, who has no name and never talks throughout the entirety of what I witnessed and beyond from what I've read, uh, he does not speak, he does not move the plot forward, he does not interact with characters besides whatever depravity he enacts on them or they enact on him. Delaney, being the genius that he is, has managed the unthinkable. Delaney has given violence itself a voice. He has given depravity itself a voice. Violence and depravity are the voices that tell this story, and these narrative voices are just too much for me to handle. Each page is replete with this voice, this grimily oozing inventive detail dedicated to this portrait of grotesquerie. It's crashing from page to page lulling your senses, infusing them in disorder, drowning the reader in that which we can only tolerate when we have a sense of humanity to anchor our sanity. Delaney has created a narrative that has no sanity, and for that, I applaud him, and I fear him. You know, try it for yourself. You may find that you don't relate to my feelings at all, but I know that many out there will. It is truly a work to behold, and one that I know that I will never be able to get through. Hog is, without a doubt, through its existence and voice alone, a book that I cannot read. So those are my words on the subject of unreadability. Like always, thank you so much for watching, and I urge you to answer this question which I'm posing to everyone. What is a book that you cannot read? Do you have one? And I want you to think about this question as extensively as I have here. Move beyond simply boring books or books that you didn't care for and try to think if there is a book for you that becomes unreadable through its sheer existence. If you have any other suggestions of categories that might deem a book unreadable, I'm highly interested in hearing those as well. And as always, I wish you all well and I urge you all to keep reading, although as we have seen here, sometimes that might just be impossible.